You'll probably be heading there soon. Someday flowers will grow there, but first you gotta go there. Oh, you will go to the moon. You're gonna get it. you will live in the stars. Your backyard will probably be Mars. You will ride a freighter scooter and eat off your computer. Oh, you will live in the stars. Your stellar smile will always be. Knowing your home and home to stay, and you'll look down upon the earth. Say, I can't believe we ever lived that way. You will go to the moon. There's plans for a hotel and a lagoon. You'll be savoring a star fruit and kicking off your moon boot. Oh, you will go to the moon. Yeah, you will go to the moon. A paradise to rival. And one side's always sunny, you'll be raking in the money How you'll get paid on the moon It's been our most abiding dream And a dream is an easy sell And when the tourists come in droves You'll be the big cheese on that orbiting rondelle You will go to the moon Daring pioneers will call the tune. A someday flowers will grow there, but first you've got to go there. Now oh, you will go to the moon. I'm going to tell you, you will go to the moon. One more, you will go to the moon. Good morning, Discovery. It's flight day eight. Hey, good morning, Mark. Uh, if you got that uh, pad, we'll go ahead and load it and be on our way. We'll uh, we'll check with prop. We're speaking with the commander of Space Shuttle Discovery, Kent Rominger. First, Kent, tell us where Discovery is at this moment. Now, let me uh, peek over here at my world map. We are going through the Atlantic Ocean right now, coming up on Africa. It looks like we're going to go right over Gambia. Now, as I mentioned, you're the pilot. Uh, it doesn't look like you're at the controls right now. Who's flying the shuttle? Actually, uh, we've got five computers on board that do a great job, and uh, as much as pilots hate to admit it, we've got a super autopilot. And the majority of the, uh, the control of the spacecraft on orbit is through the autopilot. So the autopilot is in control, and uh, actually, Colonel Brown is sitting up here at the controls, uh, ready to grab him. He's hoping he gets to grab him if the autopilot comes out. Well, we won't keep you too long so that doesn't happen. This mission marks the first time an experimental robot arm was moved back and forth by uh, controllers on the ground. How did that go? It's gone very well, and uh, this arm is a very dexterous arm. Unlike uh, most shuttle flights fly a large arm that's the length of the payload bay, about 60 feet long, a Canadian-designed and built arm that we use to uh, release and grapple satellites with. This arm is designed to go on the end of a large arm similar to that on space station com coming up. And it was designed by the Japanese to do very fine tasks. It can unscrew bolts. It can open doors. And it's a very nimble, dexterous little arm. It's only about six feet long. Does it work the same way as the Canadian arm, where somebody inside kind of uses a joystick to move it around? It does. And uh, it's too bad you don't have video of this. But right behind me is a control station. And we have two controllers, similar like video games. One's a stick and one's a, another control stick. But we can control all six degrees of freedom all the rotations, pitch roll and yaw, as well as translations in all three axes. So uh, we fly it from on board. Additionally, this arm can be controlled from the ground through a computer link-up. It can actually be flown from Mission Control there in Houston. 
Why, why is it so important to have an arm that's capable of uh, working, I guess, more like a human hand? Well, when we're on orbit in the space station, we're going to have pallets outside of the station. So uh, a lot of the research goes on inside. But in addition to that, there are pallets outside where there's a lot of science conducted. And you need an arm that's very dexterous, similar to a human arm, to uh, go out and change out different payloads, open doors, uh, pull in a new one, and the one that may have been done, position it so it can be uh, sent back to Earth or brought inside the station. Ken, you and the uh, rest of the crew have been keeping watch uh, over an ozone mapping satellite that you uh, deployed into orbit last week. I understand that satellite uh, had what might be considered a close call with some space junk. Yeah, as you may have heard, there is a fair amount of space junk uh, debris in orbit. Uh, a lot of it's left from the space programs around the world. But the, uh, I guess it could have been as close as a mile and a half uh, of rocket left over from the 1984 launch passed within a mile and a half of Christus Foss. How much of a problem is space junk becoming uh, for astronauts who go up on uh, space shuttles? The, uh, it's not really that big of a problem uh, at this point. The, uh, the debris, all the debris that's larger than about the size of a softball is tracked. It's actively tracked. So uh, on some missions, the uh, space shuttle may get a call that they see a potential hazard with some space debris. And it's fairly easy for us to go ahead and maneuver the shuttle out of the way to put us out of the flight path of that debris. So we do actively track that and uh, make sure we stay away from it. Have you personally ever had to uh, maneuver out of the way of space junk? Uh, I did. On my uh, first space flight, we had a, a small maneuver to make sure we had a adequate space between us and the uh, debris up here. Now tell us a little bit about uh, the, the satellite that's out there. What exactly is it doing? It's looking back towards Earth, and uh, it's looking back into the, the uh, medium atmosphere and looking at the trace elements, and uh, what we're really trying to do, and it's going from close to the North Pole to close to the South Pole back and forth, is trying to determine what the dynamics of that medium atmosphere are, and ozone is one of the uh, elements in that, and we're trying to determine the dynamics involved in the ozone holes moving around, enlarging, closing back down, and they're trying to get a real good handle on that. Now, when will you actually recover this satellite? And do you know about uh, the, the data that it has uh, been receiving, or will we find out about that later on? The, uh, we get some feedback, and the ground gets feedback from that satellite real time. But they don't get all of the data. So uh, when we retrieve the satellite and bring it back to Earth, they'll get a lot more of the data. But they have been receiving data. They're very excited about it. One of the things the satellite has already shown them is that there's a higher water content in the northern regions, the northern latitudes, than we earlier thought. And water plays into the formation of, of hydroxides, which are a key element in ozone. So uh, already, the uh, scientists on the ground are very, very excited about the results of CRISPR. And we plan on retrieving it day after tomorrow. Will you talk about this water? Is this water that is in the atmosphere? Yes, it is. The, uh, and one of the theories is maybe from house-sized snowballs or or comets uh, long ago impact our atmosphere. That's where that water came from. What do you all do for entertainment as you're uh, flying around uh, weightless in orbit, if you have free time? Yeah, I think that would be an overwhelming. We look out the windows. The, uh, the Earth is a beautiful planet. And uh, as we travel on this 57 degree inclination, we, we see the most of the world from 57 degrees north to 57 degrees south. And it's just an incredible sight flying over countries and seeing, for example, uh, we're coming up over Europe, and you can look down and see all of Italy. You can see the boot. But just studying the geography and looking out the window is a tremendous show. Discovery Houston, just to let you know, the Mir-23 crew has landed in Kazakhstan. Well, thanks, Houston. We're glad they're safely on the ground. Thanks for your info.
Приветствую вас. Доброе утро. Приветствую вас. And these views now uh, aboard the Russian space station Mir. And Commander uh, Vasily Tibliev uh, has been aboard the station for 185 days, uh, headed home today along with his uh, flight engineer, uh, Alexander Lazutkin. And Commander Vasily Tibliev talking with the Russian Mission Control uh, outside Moscow at Korolyov, uh, thanking them for all of their support uh, during his and uh, Lazutkin's 185 day in space, stay in space. Uh, saying that the time uh, had gone by rather quickly and uh, they're handing over the vehicle uh, to uh, in good hands to Anatoly Solovyev and Pavel Vinogradov uh, aboard uh, the station now as the Mir 24 crew and a mere 24 uh, commander Anatoly Solovyev uh, hugging uh, Alexander Lazutkin Solovyev uh, most recently flew uh, aboard uh, the space shuttle on the first docking mission uh, as part of the Mir-19 crew, that was his last mission. <laughs> the Soyuz uh, capsule for the Mir-23 crew is uh, docked to the uh, transfer node. And the undocking of the Soyuz now underway. Uh, this view looking back at the station from the Soyuz. And the Soyuz now uh, slowly backing away from the uh, transfer node attach point uh, on the Russian space station Mir. Ending uh, 185 day stay uh, aboard the station by uh, Commander Vasily Tibliev and Flight Engineer Alexander Lazutkin.